Okay, um, hi, uh, my name is Derek, and uh, in this video we're going to be looking at uh, classification tasks in machine learning. So, um, uh, and specifically we're going to be looking at binary classification in this video. So in the next video we'll uh, kind of uh, extend the ideas to uh, classification tasks that have more than um, a binary label, right? So multi-class classification. But uh, in, in any case, our, our purpose in this video, um, we'll look a little bit at this MNIST training data set that we're going to be using here and we'll probably be using a couple times uh, in this class for examples and things. Uh, but then we'll talk in general about training uh, classifiers, binary classifiers, um, and then also talk about the performance measures. So, you know, using accuracy uh, as a measure of your binary classifier, um, but then uh, extending that idea. So we'll talk about confusion matrices and precision and recall uh, in here, okay? So uh, in particular, we're kind of looking at uh, chapter three from our hands-on machine learning uh, textbook in this video here, the, the first part, okay, and then later on we'll, we'll kind of extend these ideas to multi-class uh, classification tasks here. Um, so, classification, um, in the previous chapter, uh, previous videos, we were looking at um, a supervised learning uh, task, but we were doing a regression problem. So um, uh, in, in the last chapter, we did a kind of a, an end-to-end -end example of doing, you know, working with a data set and, and building a machine learning model of it, but that was a, a regression task. So the, what we were trying to do is predict um, median house prices, right? So, but, 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 but that was a supervised learning, okay? So th there's another uh, flavor of supervised learning, as we've already mentioned, which are classification tasks, okay? So if, if the thing you want to predict, instead of being uh, a real value number, like price or weight or something, um, is a discrete category, then you've got a classification task, okay? So lots of things are similar. Uh, they're, they're both supervised learning, but there are some differences, um, um, uh, ways that you need to handle and work with classification tasks, okay? So the simplest classification task you can have is a binary classification. So that, that's the case where you just have uh, a binary label, you know, true, false, uh, yes, no, okay? Or, you know, like if you're trying to build an email uh, spam classifier, you know, the, the emails are either spam or they're, they're not spam, so they're ham, right? But, you know, binary classifiers are, are very common, right? Um, so, I mean, a lot of times you just want to focus in on a yes-no question. You know, do they have cancer or not cancer? Looking at this image data or this medical data. Um, is the email spam or not, right? So, um, so we're going to be using the MNIST data set um, to illustrate our classification, you know, building a machine learning classifier here. Um, so the MNIST data set is, is, is a very common one that's used uh, in machine learning. Um, I, I, I like to refer to it as the, the fruit, fly, fruit, fruit fly model of machine learning. Right, because it's 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 a data set that's often used anytime somebody's building a new machine learning classifi classification algorithm and they want to compare it to existing ones or they want to check performance, things like that, they might use MNIST to do that, okay? Because it's it's a nice size. So it's seventy thousand, so I mean in in today's world of big data, it's not really truly huge. It it, it easily fits into memory and can be worked with, but it, but it's still a good size, it's still a tough task, right? So um, it's it's non-trivial, okay. So let's look at it. Oh, and and um, there's there's lots of these kinds of example data sets that can be used for uh, learning and and for um, performance evaluation, things like that, available in SKLearn. Uh, they all kind of work in a similar way. So if if you um, get one of these data sets like MNIST that we just fetched here. Uh, what you'll actually get back is a standard Python dictionary, so you'll have some keys, and, and you'll probably always have um, most all these keys. There might be a few, you know, so different data sets might have a few uh, unique ones to them, but they'll all have things like uh, something so you can pull out the actual date, the raw data, so, so those are the inputs, and then the target labels will be in there, um, and then you'll have things like the feature names uh, and the target names, which will be kind of human readable um, labels of, of your features for the inputs and of, of your targets for the outputs. So, um, 
So we can pull out, so we really only need the data um, and our target labels, um, for example, here. So notice the, the um, there's actually 70,000 rows, so there's actually 70,000 samples in this data set. So the MNIST data set is an image processing data set, um, and there, there's 784 features, okay? Um, and, and the features are, it's an image processing data set, um, and, and these 784 features really are uh, pixels. So it, the, each image is a 28 by 28 pixel uh, image, and they're grayscale. So each pixel, it's not color, each pixel just has a single, uh, in this case it has a single uh, floating point value that ranges from 0 to 1. Okay, so, um, but you can convert that into standard grayscale, like maybe if you need to, like a, an, a, an integer from 0 to 255 or, or, or whatever your representation is. Okay. Um, so we can visualize what these look like. So if we look at the, uh, the, the first digit uh, in there, so that's a digit 0, I call it sample number 0. Um, and if, if we um, display it using uh, matplotlib, um, it looks like this. Okay, so this is blown up quite a bit. So this is much bigger than 28 by 20 pixels. Uh, so big you can even see each pixel ends up being a, a, a visible square here. So that's why it looks a little bit pixelated. So if you put it to its actual size, it's much smaller and doesn't look quite so blocky. But you can see also that it is grayscale. So uh, you can see th these are handwritten digits. So you can see where the, the person pressed hardest um, in writing their five. Presumably this is a five, so this is the label that we display here. It's not a really great five, and that doesn't have a very good straight line on, on the upper back part here. So it looks more like an S or something. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, the label should match the digit. Uh, remember, and there's 70,000 in here, so you could look at say the 20,000 20, sample, so that, uh, oh look, so that's a five, supposedly, although, you know, so, so you know, this, this is a real data set, so I mean, it could very well be that this is mislabeled. It's a little bit hard to say, maybe that's a six, um, and the scan, um, you know, uh, didn't scan very well, and, and we missed a few pixels here, or something like that, right? So, maybe one more here, so there's a seven. Um, so the, the, the label that we actually get um, from SK Scikit-Learn is a string, so you can kind of you can tell that if you look at the data type, it comes out as an object, so it's not really, so we really need it to be a number so that we can um, work with it with a machine learning algorithm, so the first thing we'll do is just convert that uh, into an integer. So this will convert those, um, you know, th this was actually a string label that we were outputting, but now we've got um, integers that we can actually feed into a machine learning uh, classifier um, correctly here. So, um, Here's the first hundred, just, just some more examples of these digits here. So one other thing I'll point out, I mean, you know, again, this is kind of a real data set, so there is some scanning artifacts, right? So some cleaning has been done on this, this data set, so the, the numbers were centered um, and mostly scaled so that they fit the whole uh, 28 by 28 pixels, but maybe not perfectly, and, and you know, so, so maybe some other, some more cleaning could help with the classification accuracy if you're trying to really perform well in this data set, you know, for example, removing some of these edge lines, which look like scanning artifacts. Um, some of these, like like this five, still doesn't look scaled real well. It looks like it could be slightly bigger, so maybe some of these could use some better scaling to, to, to better center and, and fit the whole 28 by 28 pixels, you know. So, but anyway, so that, that's kind of what our digits look like here, right? Um, so I think I already mentioned, yeah, I mean, it has 70,000, so conventionally the, the first 60,000 are considered the, the images used for training, and then the, the last 10,000, so 60,000 to 70,000, uh, we used as a test uh, set uh, here. So the, 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 the digits in this data set from scikit-learn are randomized, they're, they're shuffled, okay, so they're not in any order. So you can see, like, we don't end up with all the zeros for the first um, 10,000, and, and there's roughly, you know, an equal number of digits of, of, of each category here, right? So, so 70,000 divided by 10, so there, there's roughly, you know, 7,000 of each type of digit here, right? All that, mean, all, all that means is we don't have 
to necessarily do anything sophisticated to split test and training data, nor do we have to shuffle anything up since it's already kind of shuffled for us. So it's, it's ready for us to start training with it. So um, this is actually a, a multi-class classification task the way I've specified it so far, right? Because there's actually 10 categories. So, you know, the, for the full data set, what we want to do is input one of these images and have it predict what the label is. So, you know, and, and of course a good classifier would predict five given this image and a zero given this one, right? So that would be the label. Um, but like I said, in this video, we're going to be uh, first looking at binary classification and then uh, in the next video, we'll extend to the, um, the more general case of a multi-class um, um, classification uh, task, all right? But so, so we can easily just make this into a binary classifier by uh, like this. So like if we want to build a five classifier, um, we, we can create a new Y label that's true just for those that are five. That, that's what this does. Um, <clears throat> So, so yeah, I mean, this is going to be true for all the, the, the images that are 5, and it's going to be false for all the images that are not 5, so 0, 1, 2, you know, so on. So, yeah, so now we've actually got, um, after I did this, we've actually got a Boolean uh, array, or our Y train 5 is a, an array of Booleans. And remember, the first, the first image was a 5, so that was true, and everything else was false here. So one disadvantage of doing that here, so now our data is, is no longer kind of, um, uh, what's the technical term here? It's, it's, it, it's, it's no longer evenly distributed. So we've got many more examples of the not fives than we do of the fives, right? So, so only 10% of the items are fives and 90% of the items are not fives for this binary classification task that we've turned it into, which is an issue that we'll discuss here. Um, so um, later on, we're going to be talking um, about fitness functions and um, um, how you train classifiers like regression and also um, um, uh, classifiers. Um, so, but um, in this video, we're just um, um, interested in learning about, in general, how building a classifier works and how classification tasks work. So, so let, let's try a simple classifier. So this is known as a stochastic gradient descent classifier, right? So this is a type of um, gradient descent uh, algorithm that we'll talk about uh, in the next chapter of our textbook here. And let's see how it does. Um, so, you know, as, as usual, like we did um, in the previous chapter, previous videos, we can just fit, uh, in this case, so, so notice in scikit-learn, most things that are specifically to, to do classification tasks have kind of classifier on the end, and most things that are to do um, regression tasks will have, like, regression on the end. So in this case, stochastic gradient descent classifier um, is, is a good um, algorithm for doing classification tasks. And we can fit it to our five, not five, labels here and see what we get. <clears throat> so once it's been fitted, we can um, use it to predict, right? So we can, like, here we, we predict our first two uh, values. And it gets both of those correct in this case, right? Because remember, the, the sample zero was a five. So the label is true and it predicts true when we print out its prediction. So the second one is the, the output of the prediction here. And the, the second sample um, in the data set at, 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 at one was actually a zero, so it's not a five. So we should be predicting false, um, and we do, right? So, so as we discussed a little bit in the previous video, evolved, evaluating a regression task is relatively simple. Um, so we use the mean squared error to evaluate how close we were, right? The, so you take the, the 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 difference between the prediction and the correct house price, and you square that, um, and then you sum those up, um, and then we can use the square root to get the root the root mean squared error, right? Um, so, uh, and, and I mean, there's a couple of different ways you could evaluate a regression problem, but but. Um, um, you know, all of them are relatively simple, right? So evaluating a classification uh, task is trickier, okay? 
So, I mean, just as, as a quick example, uh, if we were using the multi-class classification, um, uh, how do you measure the magnitude, right? So, so it, it's easy to tell if you got it correct, you got the correct answer, right? But, but if it's incorrect, I mean, is, is there any idea of, of the magnitude of your incorrectness like we had for the regression task? So, so are you more incorrect if you guess um, a 9 when the answer is a 4 than if you guess it's a 5 when it's a 4, right? Um, but of course, um, we can measure the accuracy, right? So, so you might say, well, you know, what, what's so tough about measuring the performance of a classifier? Um, so, you know, l like we did, like we've talked about previously, um, we, we don't want to measure the accuracy just on the data that we've trained with. That really won't tell us anything useful because um, it, sh it, it, should be relatively easy to overfit um, a, a trained model on the data. So it, it can do well, even perfectly, on the train on the data that it's been trained with. But that might not give it that it, it might not be able to do well though on data it hasn't seen before, right? So we can use cross validation, um, like we've discussed uh, before, to see how it's actually doing on data that it hasn't seen. Uh, so in this case, we'll want to use our testing data, the, the 10,000 images that we held back for testing. Um, or, uh, well, um, uh, sorry, in this case, uh, we're just going to be doing cross-validation like we said before. So this will it's be using our 60,000 images, but it will do its own train validation split. Okay, so that, that's actually what's happening here. So we're still using the 60,000 training image. But um, by, by using cross-validation score, it trains it on just a subset of that. Um, so by default, uh, we can look up the, the cross-validation score. Um, so I I'm, I'm, um, can't remember how much, by default, it, it uh, splits between the, the train and the validation. I'm sure it says it in there somewhere, right? So anyway, if you do that, um, we get, um, oh, no, and, and uh, we, we did perform this cross-validation uh, three times here, so that's what this parameter does, right? And we're just looking at our accuracy. So, so we get the accuracy, so again, um, this is, um, you know, this is going to be doing a random uh, train cross-validation split, so, so you might not, every, every time you run this, you'll probably get slightly different accuracy results. So. Uh, you usually get above 93, 94 percent. So uh, all, all three times I got above 95 percent. So I got 95 and, and a 96 and a 96 here, right? So that looks pretty good, right? I mean, 95 percent accuracy um, is, is is pretty good on these images, right? Um, but um, um, so here's where we get back to the, the, the skewedness of this, right? So, so you always have to be aware of what you're doing, what you're performing, right? Uh, and try and think about the simplest thing you can do um, that, that, that would give you some results on the task. So since only 10% of the data is 5, the 90% is not 5, um, um, a, a dead simple baseline here that will get you 90% accuracy is to always guess that it's not 5, right? So that, that's all we do here. Um, I mean, I, we hardly have to prove that that's, that it works. So if we always predict um, uh, zero, so if we always predict that's false, not five, we get 90% accuracy, basically, uh, when we do cross-validation, right? So, um, so while this looks kind of sounds good that you get 95%, 94% accuracy here, 96%, um, when you think about it, um, I mean that that uh, it's doing better than than the baseline. It's doing a little bit better than ninety percent, but um, um, there definitely could be room for improvement. All right, so um, it must be missing quite a few of the fives, right? So it's it's, it's mostly guessing no all the time, um, and only picking up a few of them to get up to like the ninety four, ninety five percent, right? Maybe half of the fives or something like that. Um, so anyway, this, this demonstrates, you know, a little bit kind of why it's um, more difficult 
to evaluate performance on a classification task like this than on a regression task. Uh, so there's a couple of issues, and 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 just straightforward accuracy. You got to be careful using straightforward accuracy, right? So that um, brings us to the idea of a confusion matrix. So probably the first thing that you want to actually do when you're doing a classification task um, is instead look at the confusion matrix, right? Uh, and, and we'll talk about recall and precision here, but I often, you know, the precision, the, the confusion matrix is often, uh, you know, often even preferable to doing these summary measures like pre precision and recall because uh, when you're first starting off, you want kind of this raw idea of how well it's doing, not just how accurately it's predicting your true case, but, but all these other um, cases here. Uh, okay, so what is the confusion matrix? Um, Basically, for a binary classification task, um, you know, you can ask, so how, for, for the, the, you've got two cases, positive and negative, so you can ask um, how many correct positive cases, how many times when it was a five did it predict it was a five, that's, that's the true positives, and you can also ask how many times when it was not a five did it did it correctly predict it was not a five, that's the true negatives, but then you've got the, in, you've got also a corresponding, um, uh, two incorrect cases. So how many times when it was a five did it predict it wasn't a five, right? So that's a false uh, positive. Uh, sorry, a false negative. So it predicts that it's not a five when it's a five, false negative. And then false positive is when it predicts it's a five, but it, it really wasn't, right? So you can you can um, um, get the confusion matrix here. So we, we trained um, using cross-validation um, uh, uh, another model here. Again, we're all just using this stochastic gradient descent um, for our uh, for our model. Um, but but yes, yeah, so this is the the confusion matrix. Um, so this takes some interpretation. You just have to memorize this. Um, uh, there's a nice picture in our textbook here that I reproduce or that I copy later on here. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I often have to go back and, and do this because I, I can never remember. But basically, the, the columns are the predictions and the rows are the actual. Um, and and the, the column zero, row zero, is the, the negative case. And the column one, row one, is the positive case, okay? So that means that your true negatives are in the upper left and the true positives are in the lower right. So this is when it's a five, you predicted a five correctly. When it was not a five, you predicted it was not a five correctly, right? And then you have your incorrect, so where your model is producing the incorrect results um, for the data that you tested with, right? So again, this is, this is the data that you tested with. Like if you did a train validation um, split, um, this is... Um, um, so here are things that um, the model was predicting would be a five, and it wasn't. So false positives, and and, and the here is going to be your count of things that um, the model um, predicted wasn't a five um, when it was. So a false negative because the the prediction wasn't um, negative, um, and it falsely predicted that. All right. So, so, you know, kind of try and get yourself clear out of it. But that's what's being reported here whenever you just um, um, print out the confusion matrix, okay? So in particular, right, so as we suspect, since our data set is skewed, um, you know, the, there's a lot more uh, negative cases, and, and we get a lot correct. So we get 53,982 uh, True negatives and, and three thousand five hundred and thirty. So remember, there's probably about seven thousand. So like I said, we're only getting about half of the positive cases correctly, right? And and among the ones that we miss, um, so so um, we incorrectly got um, about two thousand four hundred. So a bit more more than half. So we don't, we've only got uh, if you add up those three numbers, that should be the number of five or these two numbers. Um, so anyway. Um, so, so here, this is, this is telling us our our, our false um, positives, where we were um, our, our false negatives, where we were um, incorrect in saying it was uh, not a five when it was. Okay, so in particular for this task, that's that's you know not surprising because kind of the baseline is to always 
um, predict negatives. Uh, so the, the, the classifier learns to kind of, you know, if it's having a tough time, to just guess negative, right? And that's why the, the false negatives end up being kind of big. And, and then, you know, our false positives are count are up here, okay? So, you know, it should be obvious then if, if you do the confusion matrix, so a, a perfect classifier um, would, wouldn't have anything in the off diagonal and, and, and all of the um, uh, results would be true negatives and true positives on, on the diagonal here, right? Um, so, yeah, it would look something like that. So, so yeah, there, there's, um, there, there's 5,121 um, total of fives, uh, so a little less than the 7,000, well, so it should be 6,000 because we're only using um, the, the first 60,000 um, values here, but a little bit less than the 60,000. Um, so yeah, the MNIST isn't perfectly, so you don't have exactly 60,000 of each. There is a little bit of, of some variation of, of the samples, right? Um, Okay, and then um, I'm going to kind of go quickly through precision recall um, and these 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 scores here. Not that I don't think these are important, but um, usually the confusion matrix when you're when you're actually building a classifier is what you want to look at. It, it, when you get to the point where you want to report results like in a paper or something, um, it becomes more important to look at these summary measures like precision and recall. So, so really, precision and recall are just summary measures of capturing some important aspects of, you know, your and and normally we're we're focused on these true positives because why is that? Because when you're building a binary classifier, usually that's the the important thing. So so like uh, think of a classifier to detect cancer. So the, the true positives are the cases where somebody has cancer and you're correctly predicting that they had cancer, right? So so it's very important that you get those true positives right usually for a binary classifier. And then your false negatives and false positives are um, um, have d depending on the application, they're going to be of more or less concern. Okay, so again, for the cancer case, where um, making an incorrect, the way you're incorrect um, 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 has different effects, right? So a, a false negative means that you predicted negative and they actually had cancer. Okay, so false negatives are bad are for life-threatening kinds of applications because you've told them that they're clean uh, and they won't seek and, and they might not seek further you know help but but they actually have cancer so they might end up dying from that false negative result right <coughs> so so false positives in, in 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 that case might not be quite so but but there are of course costs with false positives for false positives somebody doesn't have cancer you say they do so they're going to have to go through additional testing. They might start doing some treatments. So, so there, there's there's money involved, time, stress, right? So, so, so both of those have costs, uh, but different kinds of costs, right? And depending on the application. So sometimes some applications, the the fault, the the, the false um, positives are more of concern. You know, you don't you don't want to waste your your time chasing stuff that's not going to lead to profit or something. Right, so, so it can be it can be reversed on which one, and 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 because of that, sometimes precision might be the more um, important measure, and sometimes recall might be the more important measure to the application that you're building your classifier for. Okay, so precision is just um, the ratio of the true positives to the true positive plus the false positives. So so you kind of do the the ratio of the true positives to that um, divided by the sum of um, of those two, right? Um, and precision then is the ratio of the true positives to the true positives plus the false negatives, right? So, so the, the sum of these two, right? Um, and, and it's simple enough to calculate those. Um, and there's also another summary score that you might sometimes run across called the F1 score, which combines precision and recall into a single score, right? Um, I, I, I don't personally use F1 all that much, but, uh, but yeah, if you see it reported, you'll know it's, it's a combination of precision and recall, right? So what that kind of means, though, is that precision is, is a summary score of, um, of um, how you're doing on your true positives 
with relation to the false positive. So precision, like in this case, would be three out of four, right? So there were actually um, four times where we predicted it was a five, and three out of the four times we were correct it was five. One time we were falsely, we, we falsely predicted. Um, and then the recall here is, is three out of five, so there were five times um, where we, um, five times where there was actually a five. So this is actually the sum of the, the total of fives uh, in, in our data set that we tested with here. And three of the times we correctly identified there was a five of the fives that we had, right? So it's a recall. Again, recall, um, well, yeah. So, so that's that's what it is, right? So, if if your recall, you know, if if your false positives and false negatives are too high, uh, really what you need to do is build a better classifier so you can reduce both of those um, and and increase your true positives and true negatives, right? But um, you know, at some point yet, so if if your classifier is doing as good as it can theoretically, um, there is uh, you, you can. Tr tweak things because there is a, a trade-off between precision and recall. So basically, um, um, th there's a thresholding mechanism that's, that's going on that will determine, you know, so if your score is above something, you're, for a binary classifier, you're going to predict that it's it's the true case, and if it's below a threshold, you predict the, the false case. And by default, that threshold is like going to be at 0.5 or some set value, right? But you can change that threshold uh, in order to, uh, and, and if you do that, um, it will just have the effect of, of, of increasing one of these, like false positives, by de decreasing the other, or vice versa. Okay, so that, that's what the precision recall trade-off. So it's, it's uh, given one trained classifier, you can you can modify your um, um, threshold for the prediction, um, and and. Um, so, so that's one way, you know, if, if it's more important that you, you don't have false positives, you, you can change that threshold to, to, to get rid of those mostly and make all of your mistakes be uh, false negatives, you know, or vice versa, right? Um, so, so another thing that you might often see reported then are these precision recall uh, trade-off curves. Um, so, yeah, I mean, how do we decide what threshold to use? So a common tactic is to um, plot the precision and recall as a function of modifying that um, uh, uh, threshold value, right? So if you do that, you'll see um, uh, the, the trade-off, right? But, but these, these, um, these plots of precision versus recall... Um, so it looks something like this, right? Uh, but these will tell you, you know, like, like for example, if I decide to, if you plot precision and recall like that as a function of changing the, the threshold for the classifier, this will tell me that, you know, like if, I, if I move my threshold here, um, it can increase my precision to, you know, above 90% at the cost of the recall goes down there. So normally you want it pretty balanced, but again, like I was saying, uh, this helps you visualize. So, so if it is more important um, that, that you maximize your precision, you know, you can see how, uh, by, by moving that threshold, how much of an effect it'll have on the, um, the, the opposite measure, right? So, um, and I'll let you read about the ROC curve. So this is a simple, this is a similar, um, idea um, oh, that that's that's the same thing but but the ROC curves are a similar idea um, oops um, I have to check that out there had a mistake in the book here in the lecture notebook uh, the receiver operator characteristics is is uh, gives you the same kind of information um, but um, using um, a different visualization so you should read about that all right so here, for, for both of these, you know, the, the, the for this one, uh, for the precision and recall curve plotted separately, if you build a better classifier, these will both be kind of higher, right? So, and the, the, the places that they cross over, you know, will be 80, 90% if, if you can build a better classifier. And if you can't, the only thing you can do is, is kind of change the relative um, 
performance of precision versus recall. So for the ROC curve, um, you can tell somebody has a better classifier because the area under this. So, so a better classifier will push it up. Um, so where both both of this goes up real close to the, the bend is closer to zero. And a bad one, so something that um, um, a, like a purely purely random classifier um, um, will just end up with a straight line here. Um, so fifty percent will be under the curve there. All right. Okay, so that's basically, you know, um, there's a few more things. Um, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you guys read mostly about the ROC curves uh, here um, on your own. So, um, But, um, yeah, so in this video, kind of we covered these things. So, so we mostly, our, our main goal is, is to make certain you understand the basics of how uh, classification works um, and also understand these um, issues with measuring performance. It's a, little, it's a little bit more difficult than for regression tasks to measure performance. Um, and, and I mostly, for this class, kind of um, emphasize, you know, use, relying on the confusion matrix. So that kind of gives you the, the recall precision or ROC curves or, or summary measures you'll run across, uh, but you can always go back to the confusion matrix to get a more exact idea, okay? So, uh, and then in the next video, I mean, all, all the stuff we discussed here um, is, is, um, um, is still valid when you have more than two, more than a binary class, or like like you know when we have ten classes, it's just more uh, complex, you know. So so you can have a confusion matrix, but it would be for the the ten digits, it would be a ten by ten confusion matrix where the diagonal gives you where you got your correct predictions, and the off diagonal is giving you your incorrect prediction predictions, like you predicted it was a five when it was really a three, and 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 that kind of stuff. All right. So yeah, so that's it for this video, um, and um, I hope that that was useful for you understanding binary classification, um, and I will see you in the next video where we extend this to the multi-class uh, classification tasks here.